Good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to see you all. I'm starting off strong with my webcam being off, but if you just give that a moment, it always likes to turn itself off when nothing's happening. So let's get stuck in. Hi, um, nice to see everyone. Um, I know that there's a bunch of familiar faces that um, might, I might have seen before in Comp 1531. Um, I know there's a bunch of new faces of people that I've never seen before, probably a lot more new faces, but um, big greeting. Hi, my name's Hayden. I teach at UNSW. Um, and we're going to have a fun term together, hopefully. Um, so welcome to Comp 2521. Um, we're going to get stuck into the first lecture today, um, which is mainly a bit of an introduction, and then we go through a, a bunch of smaller lectures. Um, but, oh, this isn't a great mic. You can buy it for like $30 on Kogan. I wouldn't spend a lot of money on you, don't you worry. <laughs> um, but let's get, let's get stuck into it. So the first thing we're going to go through today is essentially just a little bit of an overview of the whole course because um, I think it's important at the start of a course to actually talk about, <laughs> you know, what, like what, what, what it's about, like what are we doing, shoots, labs, assignments, all of that. Um, <laughs> everything else. So first thing is uh, lecture one introduction here. So a bit of an introduction. Yeah, I got sick of the headset. It's kind of annoying around my annoying around my head. But uh, yeah, so comp 2521. Um, firstly, where does this sit in your program? This is a very exciting course to finish because once you finish this course, you can do a whole range of other courses. So um, in many ways, this is a a logical flow on from comp 1511. So um, comp 1511 is kind of the basics of C and then the two kind of immediate courses after in C are kind of 1521 where you go lower and then there's 2521 where you keep going with C and you essentially learn more about the applications of C. So if you think about comp 1511 where you learned all of the features of C and then right at the end of the course you did a bit of linked lists which was where you um, where you essentially learn how to use C for an interesting application, um, we're kind of going to be an extension of that. So if you want to, if you want a very quick sense of what this course is, think of it like the last bit of Comp 1511 with linked lists, except we're going to be doing a whole course on it. There's a lot of courses you can do after this one. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. Um, some assumed knowledge for this course. Well, we, we assume that you've done Comp 1511, um, which means we assume that you're at least a mediocre C programmer, which means we think we can tell you to write a program and you can write a program and that you understand the basics of C, um, you know, data types, int, char, float, linked lists, structs. Um, someone asked where you can get the lecture slides. It's all on the lectures page. You just click on the, the link here. So you just click on the topic and that'll give you the lecture slides. They're all in PDFs. Um, if you feel a bit uneasy with those topics, maybe you haven't done them in a while um, or something else, you can um, revise any of these topics, structs, pointers, malloc, link lists if you'd like. Um, there's some handy, some handy uh, little hints here. So it, this is mainly for people, I think, who didn't do Comp 1511 last term. Um, <clears throat> though, just in general, if you haven't done C for a while, you'll pick up on it pretty quickly again. It, it's one of those things, I think, you know, I did, a, I did a C course, I think, in my first year of uni, and then the next time I touched C was, um, like, in my third year or something. I hadn't touched it for, like, a year and a half, and at the start of it, my brain just melted. But after, like, just a couple hours with it, it all started to sink back in. So don't stress too much if some of the early stuff just makes you go, oh, my God, I don't remember any of this, because you'll probably sink back into it pretty well. Um, <clears throat> you don't think the links are, oh, are they, are they hidden? No, they should be working. I'm not sure what you mean about the links not working, but great. I'm not sure what people are saying, but, um, anyway, <clears throat> great. Excellent. Um, oh, the revision ones. I'll check these out. They should. I didn't make these. These are from previous offerings of the course. Anyway, go check them out sometime. Um, sweet. <clears throat> Just before we get into why the topic, um, 
like what's why is this course important i think just for context so um this course is not my like i don't want to say strong suit because that sets the wrong impression but this is not what i do day to day is what i should say so um you know i studied at unsw um i did this course as an undergrad a previous incarnation of it and i tutored it a couple times two or three times i think um and this is my first time lecturing the content so um <clears throat> i wouldn't consider myself some massive expert on all of this i know what we're teaching and I'm, I'm happy to take you along for the ride but um this is a course that's also been previously established i haven't written this course from scratch so um you know I appreciate some of your patience in advance if there's a couple of little things we have to get through together. But let's let's first talk about why this course is important. Now, I guess there's two different angles you could come at this with. The first one is that um, you'll often hear this course referred to as like the interview course. Um, as in when you go do interviews for big tech companies in particular, they will test you on things that you've learned in this course. So. Um, that's kind of a semi-important thing. So if you're looking to do some internships at like big tech companies, then what you learn in this course, you'll find pretty useful for getting through those interviews. Now, does that mean that this course is the most important part of your learning? Maybe, maybe not, probably not, but it is the one thing that they probably look for the most in a lot of big tech um, interviews. Why do they do that? Um, I don't quite know. My best guess is that some of this stuff is the easiest way to quickly assess if your brain is screwed on correctly um, compared to a lot of other relevant things that are harder. Like it's harder to tell if someone's a pleasant person, if they work well in teams, if they're like, um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, able to think about code and design code, which in some ways are more important skills, but it's um, it's really easy to kind of test if they're knowledgeable in these areas, right? So th this is this is a critical part of being a successful software engineer, this course, but there are other critical parts. Um, but this part is really easily accessible and therefore you will find that this course will have uh, quite a big impact if you end up going through some kind of tech interview cycles. Now, once again, I just do want to stress to people too that there are a lot more jobs out there than just big tech. Um, as a software engineer, you can basically do what you want. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel that kind of pressure always coming into your life that, you know, this is the be all and end all. And if you don't get a job at Google or Facebook, then life is pointless. But that's part one of why this course is important because it, it will have some practical impact on those that try and get into big tech. But the second part of why this course is important is because, um, it's about teaching you how to think about software at scale. Now, this is this is my sentence here, so that means it might make no sense, but here's the way I think about engineering. And here's, here's a really important thing about engineering. It's really easy in all ty types of engineering, software, mechanical, electrical, to do anything at a small scale, right? If I asked you to build me a chair, if I asked you to build me a car, if I asked you to build me a a program that will display something. It's so easy to do all of that if you only have to do it once or a few times, right? It, it doesn't matter how inefficient, it doesn't matter how poorly designed or, um, you know, how terribly managed any of the processes are. You know, one thing I always found super interesting personally was watching, I mean, if anyone follows any Tesla news, for instance, I mean, it's just an interesting company, right? Um, you know, this company tried to go from manufacturing a bunch of small cars, um, like Tesla Roadsters, not these ones, these ones here, um, to trying to manufacture hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cars a year, right? And what they found in that process was like, you know, it, it's, it's not too hard to make a few thousand cars a year, but when you have to make hundreds of thousands, suddenly all of the rules that you're dealing with kind of change, right? They kind of... You know, things that kind of work before don't really work anymore. Um, and you can kind of imagine this, right? Like this Tesla is just an example that's on my head. But like, think about cooking. You know, anyone can cook a meal for one person, right? Every meal you cook is kind of easy enough. You make one pizza, you make one bowl of burritos, you know, you make a rice dish, you do something, anything. It's kind of like some is a little bit harder than others, but most of the time it's all going to take you an hour or two. But if I suddenly came to you and I said, I want you to make me... 100 pizzas or I want you to make me, you know, 100 this or 100 that, 100 burgers, the specific methods you use to make that food will suddenly have a huge impact, right? Making one burger, one pizza, it's all pretty easy. Making 100 though, 
is where you're going to start to see cracks in the system. And fundamentally, this is what this course is about here. It's about saying to you, yes, while software just kind of works a lot of the time, we need to teach you how to think about how programs run, how programs store data, because as your programs get bigger and as they ingest more data and as they work on things at scale, subtle differences between things will have massive impacts. And I think that's kind of the, um, the main thing I want you to kind of take away from it is that, you know, this is, this is not just about writing, like anyone can write a bad algorithm and it won't matter. It's about learning how to do things that actually scale at the end of the day. So, um, I know a bunch of you have been involved in Comp 1531 where we talk about we're going to turn you from a programmer to a software engineer and in this course we're talking about um, how we're going to um, turn you from a programmer to a computer scientist. We don't want you to just to write code, we want you to think about code. We want you to think about how it works, why it works, um, what different ways to navigate it. And as the course title suggests, it's all about data structures and algorithms. So we're trying to help you understand what uh, data structures and algorithms that are good, what are bad, and what circumstances do they work in, right? Because there's no such thing as a perfect tool. There's just different tools for different situations. So we're going to look at algorithms. We're going to look at how they perform. Are they fast? Are they slow? When are they fast? When are they slow? Same thing for data structures. And then how do we make good decisions about what kind of data structures do we use? Now, something you're already familiar with are linked lists and arrays. Which ones are better? If we're going to store something, do we store them in a linked list? Do we store them in an array? Depends. Does it matter if you're storing 10 items? Not really. Does it matter if you're storing 10 billion numbers? Maybe. Quite a lot, actually. And then what are you doing with those 10 billion numbers? Are you adding them a lot at the start and then not changing them much? Are you constantly adjusting it? Like These are all relevant questions in, in the area of computer science that will help guide you as to what kinds of methods you want to follow. So someone here says, so a huge part of this course is about scalability. I think, I think what I want to make clear is like, we're not going to be talking about like scalability in this course. That's not what this course is about. This course is about data structures and algorithms. What I'm explaining to you is that the reason we're learning about data structures and algorithms is because of the impact it has on pretty much anything as the, the, the scope of what you're dealing with scales, right? And that's sometimes also why some of these big tech companies really care about this stuff. Because if you're working at a company like Google, which is perhaps one of the biggest like companies in terms of scale on the planet. Um, you can't just make a trivial change to something like the YouTube code because I don't know how many hours of YouTube are watched every second, but it's like every little detail will have a big impact. So that's why we're caring about data structures and algorithms. Um, in terms of like the core data structures, just to give you a little bit of a teaser, um, in 1511 you learnt about all these things. You know, learnt about one byte chars and four byte ints and four byte floats and arrays and structs um, which you could also consider to be tuples I guess um, and then link lists. Um, in this course we're going to be talking about more intricate lists, we're going to be talking about trees, graphs and some other things. So we're going to be expanding your knowledge on data structures and algorithms. Um, the course outline for this course, I, I, I care a lot about course outlines. Um, I try and make them as succinct as possible so that you'll actually read them because I want them to be succinct as possible. Um, generally speaking, this is kind of like a contract between you and me. So we say this is going to happen and then you expect it from us. And then if we say it's going to happen, we expect it from you. But I'll just highlight a couple of the key parts here, which are also kind of covered in the lecture slides, which is, you know, structurally speaking, just to save you time, this course is identical to 1511 in the structure, right? Like a lot of first year courses, Lex lectures, tutes, labs, help sessions, assignments, and a final exam. We don't need to go into much depth there. It's also, um, uh, it's also all done on Blackboard Collaborate, which is pretty familiar to many of you because of Comp 1511, um, which is pretty helpful. Um, I think if many of you have done 1511 recently, you would have noticed our lectures are done on YouTube. Um, I do split lectures up per topic just to make things a little bit easier for you. Um, and other things are pretty standard. So a couple of things I just want to highlight um, early and I'll get to some of these questions. Um, first one is that 
the labs are pretty much the same as um, 1511 in terms of we give you stuff to do, you submit that at the end of the week and then you get your lab marked off the following week by your tutor. Well, Waleed has asked a question in the chat that says the course outline says no marks for labs until demonstrated but lab says most of the marks come from the auto marking. So essentially the point is that um, yes, while we do auto mark your labs um, we don't actually give you the mark until you demonstrate it and it's essentially because we don't believe you've done the lab until you can talk to your tutor and they get a sense that you know what you're talking about, right? Because anyone can just submit someone else's code. So while you do get some of the marks from auto marking, the actual application of your mark will come in when um, your tutor looks at it. Um, Smoody, I will make the slides full screen. Yes, I'm sorry if I have... Uh, yeah, I'll make them full screen, don't worry. Um, one little difference on the lab though, and I'll just make this clear once at the start of the course, we are not accepting late lab submissions. Let me explain to you why this is the case. So firstly, um, we can't make labs due any later than Monday the following week. It's just not possible because we have to auto mark them and we want to release solutions, right? If we make them due later, then your tutors can't mark them, we can't release solutions, you get less help. Um, so we have two options, which is either we can make it due on a Monday and have no late penalty because it's the very latest we can get it submitted and we don't penalize you at all, or we can make them due on the previous Friday earlier and then give you a late penalty that tapers off on Monday. So I just want to make this really clear at the start because I'm, I'm going to get the inevitable forum question of people saying, oh, um, why can't I submit my labs late? That seems really harsh. And, and I guess I just want to explain that the, um, the, the alternative is that we make them due earlier so that we have time for a late penalty, if that makes sense. So we've tried to be more generous than some other courses which make them due on like a Friday or Sunday or something. And we've said, we'll actually let you submit them up until 5 p.m. Monday. These are all written in the labs, by the way, without late penalty. So week one lab, you can submit until 5 p.m. next Monday. Um, next key thing about the course is the final exam um, is 40% of the course, um, but there is no hurdle, there is no double pass for the exam. So um, you, don't, you can pass the course before the exam, though the exam waiting is quite high, so most of you will not have passed before the exam. Um, a couple of questions as well. Um, this course is not like 1531 at all. I know there's a few of you who've come from 1531. There's, there's going to be very little similarities with 1531, so you won't, you won't see anything really um, in terms of content or much structure. So there's been questions about Git and stuff, and no, that's all totally separate. Um, Hamish says, do we have to demonstrate our lab submission to our tutor by the Monday, or that can, can that happen after the Monday? Yeah, so that, that happens after the Monday. So just to give you a simple example, we have lab one this week. And then what happens is you submit lab one online by 5 p.m. of week two next week. And then in week two, you can demonstrate it to your tutor. So you demonstrate it next week and then next week you do lab two and then that's due in lab three, etc. So it kind of rolls on like that. Um, Autumn Null says, um, do we have to be at every tutorial to get stuff marked, to get stuff marked off? Um, so you don't really have to attend tutorials per se, um, but you do need to attend the lab to get things marked off, yes. Um, we generally won't like you getting labs marked off in previous weeks, like in later weeks, sorry. So if you like want to get your lab one physically marked off in week three, what I would tell you is that um, we kind of need to know that in advance. It just disrupts tutors' markings a bit. So if for some reason you can't make a lab, apply for special consideration, it'll get accepted, I'll notify your tutor and you'll be able to get it marked off later. Um, it helps the lab marking substantially if tutors can just mark off one lab per week. Um, yes. So, now let's just look at the rest of the assessments. So, as I mentioned, the key learning things are pretty similar to previous courses. Pretty much the only real difference you'll see in this course compared to something like 1511 is that we also have quizzes on top of labs and there's like seven quizzes that we do. Um, Quizzes are one attempt, I believe, and it's basically like four multiple choice questions. Um, so in week two, for instance, we'll release a quiz that you'll have to do. I'll tell you about this next week. Um, and then there's like four multiple choice questions and you just answer them and then you submit them. Um, and they're worth 10% overall, so a very small amount. And then this is like all the sum of the marks in the course, but it's pretty straightforward. All of these percentages just add up to 100. That's all there is to it. Um, Yes. I think the only other thing is that there's a little bit of buffer 
um, in the quizzes and labs where the act all the physical quiz marks are actually out of 11.2, um, but we cap your quiz marks at 10, and all of your lab marks are physically out of 16, but we cap those marks at 15. So essentially, it's it's something in the realm of like you have like a five to ten percent buffer, if that makes sense. So like essentially, you can get half a quiz wrong and half a lab wrong and still get full marks in those sections. Um, the c contributes column is um it's it's a boring column. It basically tells you what learning outcome it contributes to up here. But I don't even think the learning outcomes are numbered, so <laughs> I don't think it's very helpful. But you can you can largely ignore that contributes column. Um, is the quiz time? No, it's just it's just like a submit this sometime during the week. Um, that's all that is. A couple other questions about the course I've had is um, D Aurora says, can we submit through SSH like in 1521? Yes, it's all 1511, 1521, I believe. Give submissions. Um, if not, the instructions are very clear. Um, there aren't challenge exercises from, I don't believe there's challenge exercises in this course. Um, and the other question was from Joshua, which was, are there extensions or similar for the lab? So my general approach is that if, if you're sick or something, we basically will let you skip that lab and get a, an estimate. So if you're sick for week two and you can't do that lab, um, we will get you to essentially do an estimate. Um, some people are like, oh, I miss the, the labs. I miss the challenge exercises. Uh, this course will probably be harder than previous C courses, so I'm sure some of you won't miss them too much. There'll be plenty of room for you to be challenged in this course. Um, and then the last question I'll answer on this one is Andrew says, how many labs should we get a full mark in to get all the required marks for the labs? Um, well, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight labs, and you just need to get seven and a half of them full marks to get full marks of this. Right, so the labs are out of 16, but we kind of take, we cap it at 15. So it's half a lab, basically. Um, cool. Um, this course schedule is getting tweaked a bit. So last thing I just want to make clear is like, I haven't taught this course before. The content's good. Um, and I, I will just make little tweaks to this, which we've already made slightly, but largely the course will stay untouched. And Jay said, are there extensions on assignments like in 1511? Yeah, yeah. So assignments are all totally normal with extensions. It's just the labs because there's some logistical things about labs that we just have to account for. Um, so you can get um, extensions for assignments if you apply for special consideration. Yes. OK, I'm just going to keep plowing through this. Um, we've kind of talked through all this teaching strategy stuff. Um, so I'll skip over that. Um, Oh, sure. Um, let, let's talk about assignments when we get to them. They haven't been finalized yet. Quiz, like, so I'm getting questions now about due dates and stuff. Like, these will all be listed on the actual things themselves, so I'm just not going to spend the time to go through it now in detail, if that makes sense. Um, it'll all be written down. I'm just kind of giving you the conceptual lay of the land. So in terms of getting help in this course, we have the EdSTEM forum. You've probably seen it. Um, you just go to forum in the sidebar and then it takes you to ed and you can see questions and the questions will be answered. That's where you should put pretty much everything. Don't, don't email your tutor questions. Don't, um, don't email course admins questions. Don't email me questions. Put everything on the forum. Pretty much the only time you shouldn't put something on the forum is if, um, you know you need to go to a help session or it's of something like personal and sensitive like um, special consideration because every tutor in 2521 can see the forum even private posts but students can't so you can share stuff with either everyone or just the tutors and if there's something that you don't want to share with just the tutors then you can just email me or Kevin um, so essentially it's forum then if you can't get help there you go to the help sessions um, you can email your tutor if you need to just be aware they will often redirect you to the forum um, and then you email me and Kevin on CS2521, um, that email address anytime. Now, please don't email Kevin directly. Please don't email me directly. Um, if you email me or Kevin directly, um, we may just have your email filtered out or deleted or something. So always email CS2521 if you need to email us something. Um, Kevin is our course admin. He's an excellent course admin. He's been part of this course longer than I have. So if things go well, we can all thank him. Um, and yeah, give him a clap at the end, but, um, 
Are we allowed to post code on the forum? You can always post code on the forum. Just like, obviously, if it's code you wouldn't share with your friend because it would be inappropriate, then you should post a private thread. So you can easily post a private thread just by like saying something and then clicking private. And now only me and the tutors can see this. It comes up as private here. So you all won't be able to see this post. Um, for people looking for textbooks, these are the two textbooks that you can have a look at. Um, I don't think it's required. I wouldn't have anyone uh, stress about it. Um, but if you really want to kind of just get more support, you can go and grab this textbook. Okay. Um, in terms of systems in this course, just to make clear, there's nothing really fancy or special. You can pretty, we're pretty much just compiling C in this whole course. So um, you can do everything on VLAB, you can do everything locally if you still have things set up from 1511, you can do things um, SSH VS code if you'd like to. It's all just pretty much a C course. So the setup and the environment of this course is very straightforward. Um, and then this is just a credit slide. This course has been around for a long time and had quite a lot of people contributing to it, including Ashesh, who I don't believe is on here at the moment, probably because I copied this from him and he didn't put his own name down. Um, cool. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I want to do this at the end of every lecture. Um, uh, so at the end of every lecture, which we're just coming to the end of this first one, and then we're going to move on to the next, like, second lecture. Um, there's a QR code here, which if you all have your phones and if you could just like, you just scan this and it takes you to a page where you can just like leave very, very brief feedback on the course, like uh, on the lecture. You just select the lecture and you give it like a one, two, three piece of feedback. It's just for me because when the course kind of comes to an end, it's really helpful for me to kind of know um, what, oops, I haven't got the options there. Let me just fix that. Ooh. People have answered it. Um, it should be saved now. So, um, compiling and make files and then week one recursion. So essentially, we put this up at the end of every lecture. Thank you everyone for filling that out already. Um, I know which one you just filled that in. So I'll just put this up at the end. It's the same link every time, but it's more just like I'll pop this up briefly at the end so you can just like scan it on your phone real quick. Um, it's just really helpful because what it means is that at the end of the course, um, uh, I can just look at this and be like, where are, the, where are the lectures that were the weakest, essentially? But you don't need to fill it in um, or anything like that. And there's the, I'll leave a link on the sidebar. It's, I don't need everyone to do it. It's just, you know, if, if 20 or 30 people do it every time, that helps, helps get a sense of what's going on, if that makes any sense. So, um, great. And last questions before we wrap this one up. Um, Faye says, so how exactly will we demonstrate our lab? Your tutor will take you through that. Um, and then Waleed says, what's the policy on discussing labs? I mean, you can talk about labs with people just like any other course. There's nothing special here. Um, 